Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is Hannah, and I'm from um, I'm a Bible worker from Newcastle Adventist uh, Newcastle Uni Adventist Church, and it's actually a first time for me to be here. And thank you so much for having me here. And sorry for those who expected Matt Para to come and preach, because Matt Para asked me this Wednesday that Are you free to preach in Raymond Terrace? I was so scared because it was a reprise of him. But um, praise the Lord. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and um, I'm I'm sure that God will bless. So before we go forward, uh, let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you are God of universe. You are creator and redeemer. Father, as we open your words, I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. Please soften our heart and open, open our heart, Lord. Touch our heart and speak to us. Pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Two years ago, when I came to Newcastle as a fresh Bible worker, um, we had to read three books. Maybe a rise for a life student would remember. Great Controversy, um, uh, Desire of Ages, and Acts of Apostle. And I clearly remember one night when I was reading Acts of Apostle, I was so excited to read the story, conversion story of Saul. And I told my roommate at that time, um, her name is Georgie, and I told Georgie, Georgie, did you know that Paul's name was Saul and he used to be a persecutor of Christian? And Georgie said, Hannah, I'm surprised that you didn't know this story. But anyway, I remember that when I read his story for the first time, I was so excited and impressed how he was converted. And one of the reasons that I was so excited was even though there are so many differences of our story, I could relate to his conversion experience. So today, I want to share how God has changed my life and um, how he is using me right now. So I, I, I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the story in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. And what was the heart, hearty amen? If you are there, please say amen. Thank you. Are you all, all there? Amen. Amen. So the Bible says, Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciple of the Lord, went to the disciple of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Breathing threats and murder against who? Against disciples of the Lord. Paul's heart must have been filled with anger, bitterness, and hatred against Christians. He believed that Christians were blasphemous. He thought that they needed to be put in prison, they needed to be killed. Even after Saul witnessed the death of Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr, so a spirit of prophecy says that Paul was convinced that Stephen was a blasphemer, Christ was an imposter, that means um, deceiver or fake leader. So Paul must have been very determined that Christians are blasphemer, and he hated something wrong. He was very eager to correct the things right. And he was convinced that he should be persecuting Christians for the sake of God, for the glory of God. And I have to admit that before I was converted, I had a similar kind of hatred or anger against Christians. In Japan, people believe that, generally believe that religions are crazy or dangerous. Um, it may be because um, there are few terrible accidents caused by religious people. So people have this mindset that religion dangerous, stay away from it. 
So when I entered um, university, I met a Christian for the first time. And I was thinking, what kind of people are they? And I thought that they were weak because they cannot trust themselves. That's why they trust God who doesn't exist. Or they were maybe not illogical. Look at the world. There are so many bad things happening. Why can't they believe in God? I also thought that they could be dangerous to be friends with. They might do something strange, do like something crazy things because of their faith. But it actually got worse when I, um, when my best friend became a Christian in the second of uh, second year of uni. I thought that Christians were only people who were born in Christian family. So it did not make sense why my best friend, who is like me, who is from Buddhism and Shintoism background, can be a Christian. But when I could tell that her life was changed a lot for better. I knew that my friend used to love clubbing, drinking, and sleeping around, and all those stuff. But when she became a Christian, stop, she stopped those things. And I was thinking, what can make her so different? Half of my heart was very curious. Why? She's so different. But half of my heart was filled with jealous. I did not want to accept that she was changed by God. Ellen White also tells us that when Saul witnessed the death of Stephen, his mind was deeply stirred. Why? Because it was evident that God's presence was with Stephen. So when I saw my best friend, her life was different. Her life is like changed a lot. And my heart was also convicted because I could see God was doing something in her life. But I did not want to admit. John 3, 20, it says that, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. That time, I was in a relationship and living with a guy. So I was too scared that my action, my deeds, will be proved wrong. So instead of learning about God, who my friend just encountered, I started to criticize, blame. I talked a lot of bad things about Christians. Paul also described himself in Philippians 3. We don't go there, but uh, 3, 6. It says that, as for righteousness, I obey the law without fault. <clears throat> so he was someone who was very um, blameless in the sight of men. He was a good person, I would say. He was keeping the law. And for me, growing up, I didn't really get into a big trouble. I was rather a more um, good student at school. I was often chosen to be like a class leader, um, class captain. And also Japanese culture often tells you to be respectful, to be a nice person, to be, um, yeah, to be kind to others. Um, so that was me. I was trying my best to be a nice person in my strength. But when I end, went to Iceland, Something challenged me. In Iceland, a um, Christian friend invited me to a youth group. And he said, oh, Hannah, if you come to this youth group, you can eat pizza. So um, I, I went there for eating pizza. I was really poor at that time. And then uh, in the youth group, they were talking about um, what is sin. And they told me that all of us are sinners. And that's true. Romans 3, 23 says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. But that time when they told me that I, like all of us, including me, are sinners, I was like, hmm? I'm not a sinner. I've never killed anyone. I've never in a prison. I don't really steal, maybe two or three times. Um, so I did not think that I was a sinner. But after this meeting, my friend came to me and said, if you believe in Jesus, your life will be changed. And I was angry. 
I was so angry at him. I saw that Christians were looking, at my, looking down at my life. They think that my life needed to be changed. I need a savior. But for me, I'm okay. I don't need a savior. That was me. But please go back to Acts chapter 9, verse 3 to 4. Acts chapter 9, verse 3 to 4. The Bible says, as he, Saul, journeyed, journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What kind of impression do you get from this question? Paul, Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Jesus could have said, stop doing what you are doing, or don't persecute my people, something like this. But I see his gentleness in this question, why are you persecuting me? Isn't it true that goodness of God leads us to repentance? He was gentle, he was not condemning Saul, he was asking, why are you persecuting me? Acts of Apostle says that Saul now realized, Saul now realized that in persecuting the followers of Jesus, he had in reality been doing the work of Satan. Can you imagine if you were doing something and believing that this is for God, this is for the glory of God, and turned to be the work of Satan? That's humiliating. But I actually had kind of like a similar experience. In the last year of uni, I was doing volunteering for children in Indonesia. It was like my team goes to like a poor village in um, Indonesia, and we play music, we do acting for children, and we go to different um, places. And I was a leader of this project, and I used to tell my friends and family that I'm doing this because I want to make children happy. I want to do something good. I want to help them because they are poor, you know? But then one day, I heard a little voice asking me, why are you doing this? When I heard this little voice, I felt like the true condition of my heart was revealed or exposed. I realized that I was doing for myself. I wanted to do this for this project. I wanted to be a leader because people will think that I was a good person. Because people will say, oh, you're such a nice person. You are helping these poor children. Oh, it's so nice that you go to this poor area and help children. That's what, that's all I wanted. I wanted praise and affirmation from people, and I didn't even care. I didn't care at all of these children. All I had was selfishness. And when I realized that, I was disappointed at myself. Oh, I thought that I was a good person, but I was not. This was the day that I realized that I was a selfish person and I needed a savior. And I gradually understood that why Jesus had to come to this world, why Jesus had to die on the cross. And I realized that Jesus died for me. But still, I didn't know how I could truly believe and start following God. Um, go back to verse 5. Verse 5, uh, Acts chapter 9, it says, um, And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. I was asking Jacinta on the way here, what is goats? But it's uh, something like a spiky or sting. Um, and Jesus said that it is hard for you to keep kicking against these things. And Jesus, um, it suggests that Paul's conscience 
had been wrestling and fighting and resisting the appeal of the Holy Spirit. And then White also says, Paul had an almost overwhelming conviction that Jesus was the promised Messiah. At such time, he had struggled for entire nights against this conviction, and always he had ended the matter by avowing his belief that Jesus was not the Messiah and that his followers were deluded fanatics. Have you ever wrestled with God? Have you ever listening, you are listening to God, Holy Spirit is asking you to do something, but then ignoring and ignoring and ignoring, and it ends up hurting yourself. For me, that was when I heard, uh, when I had to graduate from uni, and I had to decide what to do in my life. It was so much pressure because 90% of Japanese people know what to do before they graduate. And once they graduate, they straight working, start working, they continue working, working, working until they retire. But I didn't know what to do in my life. And all of my friends and family were saying, oh, just do whatever you want. Ask your heart and heart will tell you what you want to do. This was everyone who was telling me. And I did it. I asked myself, what do I want to do in my life? But I did not find any answer. And I felt like I lost the purpose of my life. I didn't know why I was living because I didn't know why. What's the purpose of this life? And I started to be very, very depressed. Every morning I wake up and I ask to myself, why did I wake up? What should I do? What's the purpose? And I came to the point thinking that if I disappear, who will care? I never understood why so many people in Japan commit suicide. Yesterday, I searched a little bit, and 2,000 people died from coronavirus this year in Japan. 2,000 people. But more than 2,000 people committed suicide last month. More than 2,000 people. In total this year, 17,000 people committed suicide in Japan. It's so dark, but it's true because if we don't have God, there's no hope. And I was almost one of them. I could not find any purpose, any hope, because I didn't know God at that time. But thankfully, thankfully, one night I was struggling, I was struggling and dying and I asked God for the first time if you really exist help me last year um, we had an um, um, evangelist uh, called um, Taj Pankliff and he told us this quote it says in order to wrestle with Satan and win we must first wrestle with God and lose I love this quote and that time, that was the point that I lost. I surrendered. And God intervened. Next morning, I had a strong feeling that I should go to church. And that was a Wednesday. But I googled. And there was a church that, ha that, that had a Wednesday um, prayer meeting. So I went there and I told them, um, I lost I don't know why I'm living. I don't know the purpose of my life. Can you pray for me? If there is any purpose that purpose or mission that God has given me, I want to follow it. And I was so surprised when I said this. Holy Spirit must be working. I was surprised like what I said. But anyway, they prayed for me. And I left church. Afternoon. Um, I went to a part-time job and I was checking on the internet. I don't quite remember well, but I somehow found that um, I can study um, University of Sydney and they can give me the um, scholarship to um, study and live in Australia. And these things quickly, really quickly happen. And some people might say, oh, this is just coincidence. 
But I knew that it was very evident that God answered my prayer. But at the time, I didn't even know why I was like God was leading to me, leading me to Australia. But long story short, in 2017, February, I got baptized in Baptist Church、um, in Japan. And three days after my baptism, I came to Sydney and I started to live with Adventist host family. And my host family took me to Waitara Church in Sydney. I started a Bible study.、Um, maybe some, some might know Sharissa Fon, her mom, Gail Fon.、Uh, she taught me the Bible. And、um, Sabbath became my favorite day of the week. Amen? Amen. Amen.、Um, and long story short,、um, 10 months after I arrived in Australia, I got re baptized as a Seventh day Adventist. I didn't know the purpose of my life because I didn't know who created me. I didn't know who I really was and how valuable we were because I didn't know that I was a child of God and Jesus. Died for me. My price, your price, is the death of infinite God, Lord Jesus Christ, and His blood. This is our true value and price. If anyone is struggle, struggling with your own value, don't measure yourself with the, what society s a y or what people s a y or what you, you think. Your value is the price of Jesus. So, since then, I started to follow him. But when we make a decision for God, the devil is not happy, and the, the life got really hard after that. So, I decided to re baptize and、um, also decided to study the Bible in a rise. And I told my、uh, Baptist pastor in Japan, and he turned to be very, very aggressive. He said, Oh, what you learned in Australia is totally wrong. You are believing a different God from the Bible. Even though you become a, become a Bible worker, nobody will listen to you. I could not believe that that was happening from the pastor who I trusted,、um, who prayed for me. But、um, the battle still continued.、Um, I was supposed to come back to Japan and find a job in Japan that, after my studies. But because I decided to stay for、um, by, uh, studying the Bible in a rise, I canceled a, a flight and I stayed in Australia. And my mom, all my family are not Christian, so my mom saw that I was brainwashed and I started to be in a cult. My father, he thought that,、um, yeah, I'm a loser because in Japan nobody d o that.、Um, my sister's family, they thought that I am a shame of the family. And that time, it was really hard. The people I loved the most, I couldn't, they didn't even understand me. And our relationship was really, really tough. But not only that,、um, after my re baptism, Um, I, had,、um, I had to break up with a boyfriend that I was dating that time. He was an、um, unbeliever.、Um, he was a little bit interested.、Um, I shared my faith to him. But at least that time, he couldn't make a decision. So、um, it was difficult for me that I, it seems like I, I lost my family, my, the boyfriend that I liked. But Jesus said in Matthew, 8, 34, yeah, turn, let's, let's turn there. Mark 8, 34 and 35. Are you there? Yeah, ma'am, yes.、Um, yes, so Mark 8, 34, 35, Jesus said, When he had called two people to himself with his disciple, and he said to them, Whoever d e s i r e to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Even though it seemed like I lost everything, but I actually had everything because Jesus was with me. I would rather have Jesus than any other things. I would rather have Jesus than job or nice reputation or any other things. I would choose Jesus. Amen? Amen. And now um, I am currently working as a Bible worker, and I cannot thank God enough. Um, let us go to First Timothy, where we were doing a scripture reading. First Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 12 and 14. Paul says this, and I can um, relate to this so much. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 to 14. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Friends, God's mercy and grace is abundant and ex exceedingly abundant. We don't know who we are. We think we are dumb. But Jesus see who we can be. And yes, Paul was a blasphemer. He was a murderer. He was a persecutor. But look at the Bible. Half of the New Testament was written by Paul. How much powerful is that? The blasphemer persecutor who was against Christian, he was the one who was converted and he wrote most of the New Testament. I think this is the power of God. If God could change soul's life, if God could change me, we, he can change all of our lives. Let's, um, there are a few verses. Let's go to 2 um, Corinthians chapter 5, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And this is the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. It does not matter your past. Jesus can change us. Jesus can give us the new life. And all things has passed away. All things has become new. I would close uh, with the last um, story. During Corona, um, I moved into a new house, and um, I started a new hobby, which is gardening. Um, Jacinta knows it. Um, it is so much fun and so much satisfying when we get the harvest. And actually, I have a picture of a snow bee. Sorry for showing off. <laughs> but this is a Snoopy. <laughs> this is Snoopy. And I was so surprised because I didn't think that it will have a lot of um, Snoopy like this. And yeah, praise the Lord. And one day I was asking my roommate, Jacinta, what we should do after this Snoopy. Because we almost got all the, um, all the harvest and there were a few left. And Jacinta advised me that we should leave some and wait until it dries and died, and then we can get the seeds from this snow bee. And I was half doubting, to be honest. I was like, oh, really? Can we really use that seed to grow the another plants? 
But yes, as she said, um, it grew and it's actually growing now. But it told me something, um, something very important. Please come with me. The last verse, uh, John chapter 12, 24. John chapter 12 and 24. John chapter 12, verse 24, it says, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Okay. I didn't quite understand what this verse means before, but it makes sense now after this snow bee experience. So the snow bee that, ate, that, what, that I ate, it went to my stomach and it's digested and it's gone. That's it, right? But the snow bee that, was, that we were waiting that until it dries and died, it was not even eaten. It, was, it didn't have the life, but it gave the life to the next generation. And this is like a Christian life, I think. We are not meant to live the life in this life, but we will rather give our life to God and give our, our life to others. When we die, we give lives to others. And this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. People think and people say that we should do whatever we want and we will be happy. But serving ourselves never, never make us happy. Matpara, Matpara often says that freedom is not doing anything you want to do, but fulfilling the purpose that you were created for. I will say again, freedom is not doing anything you want to do, but fulfilling the purpose that you were created for. We can do anything, we can have pleasure, we can do anything we want in this world. We can have money, a wealth and job and status and reputation, everything. But we will still feel empty if we do not have Jesus in our life. Because God has the true purpose for our life. God knows us more than we do. God has the best plan for our life. And if we are not fulfilling that purpose, we will not be happy. And God actually has people for you that he wants you to reach. Serving him, serving others, giving your life to others. This is the way that you will have the true happiness and joy in our life. And I want to ask you this question, are you living the life of your own or are you living the life of God for him? And this is the question for me because even though we can give life to Jesus once, we can still serve ourselves. Isn't that true? Every day we have to give our life to God. We have to surrender. We have to die to ourselves. We, want to, we need to deny ourselves so that we can take up the cross for him. And this is the one day, each day battle. It's so hard to overcome ourselves than any other things. This is the greatest battle. But is this your desire for today? Do you want to give your life to Jesus? And I want to uh, finish this with this appeal. Do you rather have Jesus in your life? Is it your desire to deny yourself and take up his cross and follow him? Is it your, your desire to say, I want to say yes to the purpose that he created for me? Is it your desire that I want to follow him rather than following myself? If it's your desire, please stand up with me because this is my desire as well. And friends, I want to say that Following, following your heart, serving your life, it does not give you any satisfaction. And praise the Lord, 
This is God's desire that He will restore His image in you and He will do amazing things in your life. I love this quote. Um, some, uh, Ellen White she says that if our desire became His desire, we will be omnip om omnipotent. That means we can do anything. That is not cool. Do you want this in your life? I do. And let's pray that we can day by day surrender our will to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you created us. Thank you that you have the true purpose for us. Thank you, Lord, that you came to this earth to die and you gave your life to us. Father, we ask you that day by day we can deny ourselves and follow you. Help us, Lord. Temptation is real every day. But help us to give up our own desire and we can give our life to you every day. Please work in us. Please change us because you are coming back, coming back very soon and take us to home. Father, thank you so much that you are God who hears our prayer and who answers our prayer. Pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.